Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julian, and thank you very much, everybody, for attending today to listen to what we have to say. Um, when I was asked to participate in this uh, in Jib Talks, it was one of the most difficult things that I've had to do, because normally when I have a speaking engagement, it really is very well defined. I'm either asked to talk about something about politics, the public finances of Gibraltar, for example, or in relation to my profession, some legal principle that has arisen from a case that I have done that may be of interest to the legal profession. So when I was asked, well, you can talk about anything you want in your life, with no limits, it really stumped me. And it was only after I spoke to a very good friend of mine, I asked for his advice, John Gomez at the Piazza, and I said, and I asked him what I should do, that I uh, alighted on the topic of my talk uh, today. And as usual with John, he answered a question with a question. He said to me, has there been any experience in your life that has really made you question your life? And that's what I want to talk about today, about defining moments in people's lives, how I had one, how I dealt with it, and how it changed me as a person. Many people have defining moments, moments w which make you reassess uh, your life. It may be the fact that you have an illness, or somebody close to you has an illness, or you've lost a loved one, and it makes you realize what is important in life and what is not important in life. It may be a moment that makes you realize that your life is taking perhaps a turn for the worse because of decisions that you're taking, that you're hanging out with the wrong people, or that you're simply making the wrong choices about partners, about careers. And if you listen to your instincts, and I'm a great, great believer in listening to my instincts in everything that I do, uh, a friend of mine described it as your body's GPS, you may realize that you are lost, you may realize that you have to recalibrate uh, your life. And it's that realization that becomes a defining moment in your life. And I had one of these moments when four years ago, as I held the, the hand of my four-year-old son and my best friend's four-year-old daughter in the presence of my 13-year-old uh, boy, somebody stuck a, an eight-inch knife nine, nine inches into my body, cut my spleen in half, and in the ensuing struggle, cut me from here to here, stabbed me in the leg, and uh, I'd also cut my, my hands. And I want to say at the outset, and I want to say this not because of any altruistic reason, but actually because it helped me to cope with the situation. That I don't blame the guy, that I think he was a very ill person, that I want him to recover, that I want him to come out of prison sooner rather than later to be with his family because they're very decent people indeed, and I know them, they're very decent people. But for me, it had a very profound effect. Why? Well, not only because of the trauma that it created for me and also for my family, but also because of the realization that the one thing that I'd wanted to do since I was a child, which was my involvement in politics, was a catalyst for that major trauma for my family. If I hadn't been Minister for Justice, it simply would not have happened. It happened because somebody who was very ill, had a gripe against the legal system because he hadn't obtained legal aid to fund his defense of an English council, his defense in relation to an attempted murder of a doctor rather than have uh, local uh, lawyers uh, representing him. So the very decisions that I'd taken in my life, the very turns that, 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 that the, 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 my involvement in politics, that which I really wanted to do since I was a child, really contributed to this and it made me question those decisions. Politics had been the center of most of my life for 10 years, and now there had been a significant price to pay. And indeed, for many months afterwards, the advice that I received from friends, and I see uh, uh, some of them here, and also from my close family, was, well, you've built a new prison, courts, you've done this for the legal system, now this happens to you, it's not worth it. It's simply not worth it. Concentrate on your profession. Concentrate on making money. Forget about it. Concentrate on your family. And my instincts, for much of those months, told me that, that was the correct advice. And indeed, every single time that my son used to come back from therapy, I thought, not only are those my instincts, but it's the, pos the only possible decision that I could take in the circumstances. And indeed, had I done so, it would have probably been a perfectly reasonable reaction to that defining moment. But I didn't. 
and I want to explain to you why I didn't and how uh, it changed me uh, as, a, as a person. One of the first things that I, that, I, that I was very conscious about from having represented clients in England, I'm a litigator, a court barrister, from representing uh, clients in England who had suffered shock um, and trauma was that shock and trauma has the propensity to tap into some very deep emotional sentiments in the mind. And if you're not prepared to accept what has happened and try and move on, easier said than done, it really can subconsciously take over your life and it really can lead to a spiral of, uh, of negativity. One of the things that the do uh, doctor um, said to me, and it resonated because of my experience as a litigator, was that trauma leads to an emotional resistance to accepting what has happened and moving on. And that is what I realized very early on, and that is what I was determined that it wouldn't uh, happen to me. So for the first moments, well, not the first moments, but the first uh, 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 a few months afterwards, I made a conscious decision that I would choose forgiveness in my life rather than bitterness. Bitterness is a negative emotion. Forgiveness is a positive emotion. And for me, that's why I've said what I said at the outset, it was important that I forgive rather than feel bitter. It was also important for me to be as positive as possible in my outlook on the situation. And I would always say to my family, the glass is not half empty, it's half full. Of course, if the knife had been a centimeter to the right, it would have cut my iota, and there was nothing that anybody could have done for me. But it wasn't, that's the point. The point was it was a centimeter to the left, and therefore I survived. Somebody else might not have survived. And that was the positive in my life. And one of the things that um, always affected my father in particular, but also my mother, and I think it's because um, parents feel very protected towards their children, was the fact that because I'd lost my spleen, I was more prone to infection because your immunity levels are, are suppressed because the spleen regulates uh, immunity. And the doctor had left a little piece of spleen attached to, um, to an artery. And I always used to say to my dad, half in jest but half seriously, that spleen is going to grow back. You see, that spleen is always going to grow back. There's no evidence of that. And I don't know whether it's going to grow back, but it doesn't really matter. I prefer to think that it was going to grow back, that it didn't grow back. And of course, I also needed to return to normality. And that's why I made a conscious decision to try to return to work as soon as possible to try and go to the gym as soon as possible. And Dr. Gramat, uh, who is the doctor that uh, uh, saved my life, but also was very good to me, very kind to me, he used to go to the gym with me every single day that I used to go for about four months. We started with little weights and then uh, moved on to larger weights. And within six months, I was lifting the weights that I was lifting prior to the incident. And I want to relate to you a really at one of those moments that really will stay with me uh, for the rest of my life because I was half in shock but half broken with laughter. I came out of the gym one day having felt really, really pleased about the fact that I'd been making such good progress. I was walking down Main Street and this elderly couple, they saw me and they made a beeline for me. And this uh, elderly lady, she says to me, Mr. Fetum, Mr. Fetum, I'm really, really glad to see you out. We've been praying for you. I said, and it was in Spanish. I said, well, señora, muchísimas gracias, de verdad, te lo aprecio. And then all of a sudden, she cocked her head like this. And she sort of looked at me, and it was, something clicked in her. And she said to me, pero Mr. Fitton, pero si parece tu más joven. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, she just cracked her husband across the ribs and said, vete tú en busca del fulano que te dé a ti también. I... <laughs> <laughs> and, she just, and she just walked away, and she just walked away, leaving me there half in shock and half broken and half broken with laughter. That's one of the wonderful moments in my life. And of course, I made the decision not to turn my back on politics because to have done so 
And this is all it boiled down to. To have done so would have been a negative response to the incident, would have been a decision that would have been imposed on me, and 10 years down the line, I would have looked back and I would have looked on my life uh, with regrets. But it did also uh, change my life, and it changed me as a, as a person. Anybody who knew me prior to the incident, uh, uh, friends in particular, would be able to tell you that probably I'm one of the most, or was one of the most intense people that you could, uh, that you could meet. Um, when people would, would laugh at a particular incident, I might actually look at the serious side of the incident. Or because I was so engrossed in my work, uh, somebody would crack a joke and the penny would drop about four seconds later because I was thinking about um, something, I was thinking about something else. What my wife would call uh, the earth calling Danny moment. That's the, that's the one that she, that she, she always uh, uh, referred to it. And it made me realize that really there is a time and a place for everything. But what is important in your life is your family and what is important in your life are your friends. Of course being leader of the opposition is a great, great responsibility. It's a great honor for me. But at the end of the day there will be other leaders of the opposition. There will be other chief ministers of Gibraltar. But there will only be one father to my children, one husband to my wife. And that is why it's been important to me something that perhaps I didn't do enough of uh, when, uh, before, before this particular incident, to make sure that I participate in the lives of my children more. Every single day when I go home, I try and play at least 30 minutes with my son, with my eight-year-old son, uh, in, on the PlayStation with a game that he likes, which is called Cars. My character is Francesco, is an Italian Formula One racing car. <laughs> that tells me, yes, it tells me that I'm poetry in motion, it says to me. Although I always come 10 out of 10, I have to say to the delight of my eight-year-old son. My son and I, my elder son and I, we like going walking. We've done the Camino de Santiago. My daughter and I, we like looking at the internet and buying uh, paintings for the, uh, for the house. And I think that in politics, too, it also changed me. Because it makes you realize that the journey is always more important than the destination. In politics, there are always got to be winners and there have always got to be losers. It's how you conduct yourself in between. You've got to do the, the, the best that you can, and as long as you do that, as long as you can look at yourself in the mirror every single morning and say, I have done the best that I can, and as long as you don't leave anything in the locker, that you say everything that you need to say, then I think that you've done everything that you can do. I know that I'm going to be stopped and that I'm going to have the, uh, the embarrassment of, of, uh, of listening to the horn. So um, all I'd like to say is that the message of my talk is positivity in your life always above negativity in your life. And if something like this happens to you, if you have a defining moment, always make sure that you look at the positive and not the negative. Thank you very much.